Uh, Rich Schmidt, I'm here with Michael Claypool at Clay Pigeon Winery in Portland. It's July 25th, 2016. Michael, we're going to start you with an easy one. Why wine? <laughs> uh, well, I think for me a lot of uh, wine got into uh, a, a few kind of reasons. Um, one, I think what I love about wine is the same thing I really love about food, which is really about bringing people together. Um, I, I see wine as, as a piece of food, and thus it's all about what goes on the table. Um, there's another part of me that says, why not wine? It's super fun. It, it makes you happy uh, in moderation. Um, and then the last is that, you know, I got into wine, and uh, my background is one where I've always kind of worked in um, like digital marketing and strategy um, as like the career side. So I've, I've done that for 17 years, and I think there was a certain point where the physical, tangible object, the thing that you actually make versus the thing that you think about or it gets made, but you know, it takes like a computer or a phone and then a browser and then a thing, like all these other layers of technology, and it's not, it's ephemeral, uh, became a really strong reason for me of like wanting to like uh, kind of physically make the object rather than just kind of uh, think about the object. So how did you get your start? So um, I'd always been kind of interested in wine, you know, um, uh, an enthusiast in that way of like kind of keeping up on it without necessarily like doing too much formal. And then uh, it actually happened that my wife and I were on our honeymoon and she said, I'm giving this up. She was, uh, had been doing a product management for Charles Schwab, the, the, the investment house. Mm -hmm. And she was like, I'm thinking about cheese. And everyone was like, that makes total sense. You love it. Like, that'd be great. So she ended up taking an internship at a place called Artisanal in New York City. And at the same time, I, I said, well, then fine. If you're going to do that, then I'm going to start studying wine more professionally. And so I, I took uh, what's called the advanced course at uh, the WSET, which is basically a British, uh, the Wine and Spirit Education Trust. Um, and if you're going down the path to be a master of wine, WSET is the path. Like if you want to be a Somalia, you do the master Som system in, mm -hmm. in that society. Um, so I, I took classes, um, you know, which was like 16 weeks, really intensive. Um, and then because I didn't want to lose the knowledge, then I took a job at a wine shop, did nights and weekends. And then that led to the opportunity to, to be a Somalia, like, you know, kind of gain the experience. And then that led to getting a chance to go out to Sonoma and make in 05 at this point. And so I went out to Sonoma to make a, at a Pinot maker called Papa Pietro Perry, uh, two gentlemen. Uh, they were about eight to 10,000 cases. And so did a harvest with them and then kind of caught the making bug at that point. And so you started with garage wine, is that right? It is, so tell, yeah. us, tell us about how you learned to actually make it. Yeah, so it's really interesting. Um, so about 10 years ago, my wife and I did a project called Cheese My Hand. And we went around and we did interviews, kind of like what you're doing. We did oral histories of, of, of cheesemakers around the country, of kind of what was happening with the artisan cheese scene that was starting to emerge. And so I spent a whole summer interviewing, chatting, working on the farm with these guys. And then at the same time, we're also, this is right when I had just been doing the winemaking side. So I started getting more conversations with winemakers. And there was a really common theme, which was you can make wine in your bathtub and some carboys and do five gallons at a time. But there's a certain point where you're going to need to scale. And you just have to, as they would say, put on the big boy pants and just do it. <laughs> so. Um, we moved out here in 08. Uh, as soon as we bought our house uh, and harvest came around, I went out and found a grower who I think was amused by me and sold me a thousand pounds of grapes, which to me would make enough to do one barrel. So I bought enough to put it in a normal fermenter, uh, these one ton fermenters that we, a lot of us use, uh, so I could go through the, in essence, the, the chemistry of it. Like, mm -hmm so that I would understand the heat transfer, I'd understand kind of the movement in that way. Um, and that then let me um, um, then move it into a barrel and be able to go through the whole process at the scale. Um, yeah, so in 2009, uh, I made one barrel of Pinot Noir just for friends and family to kind of learn the process and see what I thought of it. Uh, and then as it so happened, I was walking in the neighborhood and came across uh, a neighbor who his garage door was open and he had all these barrels in there. Mm. So I walked up and I was like, wait, 
are you making wine here? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, is that legal? And he's like, yeah, it's totally legal in Oregon. And I was like, oh wow, because in California and New York, it's not legal oh, okay. to have a residential making commercial. Interesting. And so uh, he's like, yeah, 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 you just got to do this, this, and this. And so I um, thought about it for a while. 2010 came along, made another barrel. And then by 2011, decided, all right, let's do this. And so I converted our house garage into our winery. So that was our first location of Clay Pigeon was uh, a two-car garage, and we made three barrels of wine, um, and that was it. And the idea was, very slowly, we'll just make in the garage and slowly build up. Uh, but then we found this space uh, soon after and decided to, uh, to, to, to lease it. And so once we did that, then I had to scale pretty quickly to kind of justify the space. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. So you, you, you took an interesting path. We don't, we don't talk to a lot of people who were sommeliers first yeah. before they started making wine. So tell us about that and how that helped you with your kind of future endeavor. Yeah, I, to me, it, I think in some ways, like, look, yeah, you listen to a lot of folks. They started because they, wanted, they really just wanted to be with the land. They wanted to, like, they were super into the make process. They, they're into systems. For me, like, again, I, I'm so excited that I came in from this other angle because it really, I think, one um, has, has allowed me the ability to kind of contextualize what it is that we all do and how we, why, the, the decisions we make, but also like the styles that we can ultimately make. Um, you know, I, I think it's really interesting when I, and, and it's not really a, a criticism necessarily, but I always find it fascinating when I talk to like a winemaker and I'll mention like, oh, this wine or this wine region, and they don't really know what that is. And to me, I think that's so integral to like the history of like how we got to some of the places that we are, the styles of wines and those differences based upon regionalities and, 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 and the microclimates and uh, the terroir, as they say. And so uh, I found that to be really invaluable, but I also think it also just gave me a, a very specific point of view, which is that wine is food. And I think from that, it always has led me down a path of thinking about, well, what, what would we serve with this? Like, what, what food-wise would I like to have if I'm making this kind of wine? And, or, you know, and thus, what decisions will I make in the winery to get it towards that product um, that I can put on the table? Um, and I think it gives it, a, I think for me also, finally, a little bit more uh, of kind of humility I love that, like, uh, you know, for, so there's Clay Pigeon and then instead of a tasting room, we have Cyril's, which is a restaurant. And what I've always loved is that we have wines from around the world on our menu. It's not just our wine. And partly that's because, um, one, I don't want to drink my own wine all the time. I mean, and I don't expect anyone else to either. But two, that I think it helps give humility and kind of keeps you in check of like, what it is that you're doing? How good is that product? Because there's amazing wine being made, and if you really are into it and you're an enthusiast, like you should be wanting to bring in all of those wines and be like, "Isn't this amazing?" <laughs> um, and 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 try to find your place on that shelf with them. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier that you had to scale quicker than you were anticipating. Yeah. So take us take us through the kind of trials and tribulations of how that went. Yeah. I mean, so yeah. So we got this space, uh, and um, you know. Once we knew we were going to be getting the space, it became this really interesting dance of like, will we be ready in time? And thus, I'm going to order more grapes. But if, we're, if it's not ready in time, then I'm going to have all these grapes and know we're really to make it. Um, not enough room. But um, so we ended up arriving. We went from you know set, basically about three barrels, about 75 cases in 2011, and then in 2012 we scaled to about 550. Um, so a big jump, but not like so insane. Um, but it still, it was kind of amazing because other winemakers would come in this room and it would just be like six barrels and like four <laughs> fermenters and they're like, what, you have all this room? And I was like, I'm getting there, I'm getting there. I just, um, because I do think that that um, is one of the things, like, in, you know, winemaking, what's fascinating, uh, like uh, talking to neighbors who are brewers, you know, every day, every few days they make, um, which can be exhausting because you're just starting all over again. It's a lot of cleaning. You know, I always say winemaking, cheese making, beer, all this, just about cleaning. Um, but the other part is um, they get a chance to kind of perfect the system. Mm -hmm. um, wine, you get one a year. I mean, technically, sure, you could buy frozen or get grapes from it. But let's, for the majority of us, we make wine once a year. So it's, um, it's a little more of a high wire act of like, can I get this done? And am I going to do all the decisions right? Because you get it wrong, you don't really even know fully, maybe for a while, mm -hmm. uh, that you maybe didn't like the outcome of that experiment you just did. Um, so I think that it's, uh, 
I think the thing that's been fascinating was like to, to grow, like to jump, you know, tenfold almost, but then have that counterbalance of um, the systems that you need to kind of like, what's the flow going to be? And like, and even to this day, like we've now done five inches, this will be our six coming up. Like every year I start the year going like, wait, what did we do here? Like, <laughs> because there's always some little moment that you're like, right. Because again, like, you know, you only even have, let's say, five days of processing. So let's that's five times five. I've only done 25 days of having grapes arrive, putting them through the pressure to stemmer and making those choices. Um, you kind of realize, you kind of don't, re you don't realize how quickly you can forget those items. And sure. everyone talks about write all the notes down, but you'd almost have to like have a camera on you the whole time <laughs> to really get the nuance that can really happen because some things you wouldn't write down are the most important. So it is, it's always been fun. I mean, it's a, uh, um, you know, we took this space, it's, it's got 14 foot ceilings. My wife was very much like, this has got to be high enough, right? And I was like, I think it will be. And when we have the forklift come in, and we basically do a system where you have a forklift with a rotator and it turns the, the, the bin that has the grapes in them on their side. And I think we probably have about six inches <laughs> clearance. Um, so it's like one of those things where you're like, did I 100% know that when I got the space? No. It was very happy that that worked out because you, you go like, sure, that's plenty of room. But it's, uh, you know, we've been pretty lucky. Um, and I think by, while growing quickly, we've still been growing pretty, pretty slowly in the grand scheme of things. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of allowed us to kind of grow and figure out that kind of, the shifts in, in ebbs and flows of, of production that kind of happen. You talk about nuance in winemaking. And we, of course, we hear that a lot from a lot of different people. How long did it take you to feel comfortable making some of those nuanced decisions? Uh, yeah, it's interesting. Like, I, I would say definitely say the first time, even starting in like '09, just for for us, um, it was kind of like, okay, I'm only, I'm not. This gets into a little bit of also like nomenclature that people use around like natural winemaking or these phrases where they say like we non-interventionist, mm -hmm. which I, I've always hated those titles because you're always intervening. Um, I mean, nothing is natural about that. Putting wine in a barrel and you know pushing out into a bottle and all of this. So. So if I start from that, I say like, well, the trick is reduce the number of inputs the first time, and see what you get, mm -hmm. and then next year you kind of and you start to kind of just make little. But I would say pretty quickly, you know, I, I'm a big fan. I always obviously I, I use the lab a lot to get like readings to get a sense of like where the wines are, like what the pH is versus the potassium level, all these different things. But I got to say honestly, I rely much more on the gut to say like, I feel like this is going to be okay, and go ahead and, and going for it. Um, rather than making one by the numbers. Because again, I think this goes back to the, the why. Um, I didn't get into it because I'm, I'm really a geeky science guy who loves like chemistry. Um, I love chemistry, but I, I bluntly was okay at it. Like, um, <laughs> but I think I'm much better in the sense of like intuitively like tasting something and understanding its relationship. Um, and it was the part of the job as a Somali I really did love the most, which was um, having a dish come out and trying to figure out what I should pair with that and how to pull out and tease apart those components. So I, I rely a lot more on like the gut to be like, where do I think this wine's gonna go? And I think the years of doing it, and I look forward to you know 10 more years, 15 more years be under my belt to feel a lot more confident like, oh yeah, I've that, that is gonna go this direction. Where at first you're like, I, I don't know what this is gonna turn out in six months or a year from now. Um, and I think that's what you gain over time is every year you get a little bit more confident that you can see the arc of where the, arc, the wine's gonna mm -hmm. go um, and start to make some decisions or decide to leave it alone. You know, rather, you know, like, oh, you know, do I, you know, in, although nowadays it's hard to believe it, but you know, there was a long period where adding sugar to Pinot Noir was a very, it's an accepted trade in, in Oregon, like Burgundy, to help beef up mm -hmm. the levels because it was always cold and rainy. That's not really the case anymore, but for the longest time, like, people would do that. And so it became a question of like, do you want to add sugar, which is kind of, messing with it a little bit, mm -hmm. if you will, although it's historically been done for generations, or do you leave it alone and then accept that you might have a thinner, lighter, lower alcohol wine? And you see all of those. And I think the more you taste and the more you're out there in the world and you're trying from different regions, the more you kind of go like, oh, this kind of falls into a more Germanic um, Pinot Noir where it's a nine to 10% alcohol versus a California or a Burgundy. Sure. Yeah. When you're getting started and you start in your garage and then you, you, you come into this space, 
Did you did you ever consider not being at Urban Winery? Did you ever consider going sure. out and being rural, more rural? Yeah, what, 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 what I mean, I think doing? honestly, like when we moved out here, it was very intentional to move out here so I could start making wine. Um, you know, with a little bit more focus, and but uh, I just assumed, of course, that we'd move to Portland, but eventually I'd have to move down, or at least commute down to the valley, and you know, to make or apprentice or do all those things. And uh, I think, you know, the first year we were getting our feet in us, figuring out the city and everything. That's when we started kind of reading about and hearing about some of these uh, urban wineries. And so by the time it rolled around for us to open, yeah, it it it, it was like, well, we could go down there. But I also think we, we were very lucky, and I would say all of us up until probably the last like year or so have been lucky that there's property in, in Portland, especially for this tile of industry space, isn't so bad. Um, it's still cheaper in the valley, but then you have to offset either having to commute and mm -hmm. the gas of that or completely move the family and all those things. So I think, it's, um, I think that's changing and will get harder and harder every year for a new winery to move in and have decent rents that they could uh, be able to keep it somewhat um, on par with what's happening in the valley. Um, but I do think that ultimately, you know, what urban allows you is the ability to start to grow and become like a massive winery. No one's really done that. It, it's, I'm not saying it can't be done. I just think like this goes back into the equation of, of the math of buying a building and the rent and, mm -hmm. and how much space do you really need. Uh, so I think it's, uh, yeah, I, I think for me it was always, of course I'm gonna have to move down there and then realizing, you know, people like Hip Chicks uh, on the Southeast, they had been here since 02 and showing like, no, you can do it here, find a cool space and like make a go of it. So what are some of the differences you see between the urban wineries and the more rural wineries as, a, as kind of a group? Well, I think, I mean, the thing that we always kind of say is, as urban wineries, um, if you live here in Portland, like, I love going to wine country, but it's a commute, mm -hmm. and it's a day. If you're gonna go down, like, you're gonna spend all day and maybe visit three, you can pull off. Unless you're gonna go to like a place like Carlton Winemaking Studio where there's like a group of them in one spot. It's hard to hit a bunch. What the, the valley has is the, the scenery. It's bucolic, it's this beautiful uh, um, up on the hill or looking out over the vines. Um, it's all within that context, mm -hmm. which is, I think, really powerful and really, amazing. Um, I always say like for Portland, I think what we always talk about is like, we like to hang out with each other. Um, and you can do that a lot better here than when you're spread out through the valley. Unless again, you're like making on the outskirts of Dundee or a town where like you can somewhat like, find each other a little bit easier. Like on the whole, it's a little more isolating. And so like you have your space. And so I think like what I love about it is the community um, and that you know, we live here. Like, we're, we didn't, we like Portland. We don't want to leave Portland. We want to be a part of this community. Um, and, and to show that you don't have to travel, well, you know, as we always say, we'll let the grapes travel for you. Like, we'll bring the grapes rather than you having to go to the grapes, mm -hmm. but yeah. And how about your clientele? We hear a lot of reactions from urban winery about you can't have, you can't have a winery in the city. There's no grapes here. So how is your clientele, uh, have you educated? How have they caught yeah. up? You know, it's, it's interesting. I think, um, in Oregon, I think actually people get pretty quickly. I mean, there's always the question of like, where do you grow your grapes? Most of the questions are not that. The, most, the, the, the number one question is always like, where do you get your grapes from? So they, they already in, instinctually understand the relationship that there are growers. Mm -hmm. and, then, and we always say like, yeah, we're like breweries. Breweries very rarely grow their own, you know, sure. malt, barley, and, ha and having, you know, uh, their hops. They're working with farmers, and some of them are very local, and some are really far. Um, for us, same kind of math applies. You can go further away. I have grapes that come from the Rogue Valley. It's like a four-hour drive. Um, some people will get from California even and have them trucked up, or you can get something that's 40 minutes away down in the valley. Um, so I think that uh, the education is there a bit um, about no, no, no. It's great. We work with vineyards and. And I think that that's also a really interesting thing because I think that there's a whole group of customers. To them, you're not really a winery unless you have the land. Mm -hmm. Estate, as mm -hmm. they call it, estate winery. Um, and, you know, I don't really have a response to that. I'm like, I, I would love to have my own vines. It's a very expensive proposition. Um, and so I think that 
unless you're starting with a fair amount of money or interesting relationships to pull that off, it's really hard to, to do an estate winery uh, nowadays, um, unless you're in a brand new wine region that's up and coming. So I think it's, uh, um, we're always, I think, gonna be a group that does that, but I think the flip side is like when you're in the city, you're getting a whole group of people that normally would never go to wine country. Sure. Because they don't really see themselves as wine people, yet they like to drink wine. Mm -hmm. um, they feel that that's a very, because it is a very different experience, like driving around, going out, it's very bucolic. Like all those things start to happen and it creates a tone that I think that we try to push against by being like much more accessible, we're just like you. <laughs> like, you know, we listen to like, you know, rock and roll and like, you know, whatever <laughs> else you want to say. Like all these kind of like antithesis to high on the mountain kind of thing. So uh, I think that's where we kind of find our place. And yeah, it means that we're gonna lose some customers because they, they don't bluntly like it. They don't, they want the bucolic. And mm -hmm. I don't, I mean, look, if you're coming in from out of town and you're visiting, I get that, I totally get that. Um, you wanna see really what the land looks like. Because ultimately for all of us, whether you're growing the grapes yourself or you're buying them, it all goes back to the grapes. So sure. if you don't have any relationship to that, then then, this is a bit problematic if you just think like they just magically show up someday. <laughs> you know, because that does happen. People say like, they don't really understand when harvest is. They just assume, like breweries, they think you can make anytime mm -hmm. you want. And it's like, technically that's somewhat true, but not really. People don't really do that. They don't get that this is a, it's a harvest, like picking tomatoes, that it has a season that when it becomes available. So I think that's where we spend more time is probably talking to people about seasonality and what we're expecting out of the weather and mm -hmm. how that's going to affect the grapes. So tell us about the name Clay Pigeon and how that came about. Yeah, so Clay Pigeon started because uh, my last name, Clay Pool. So um, when I was thinking about the winery, I did not want to name the winery after myself. I'm not a big fan of uh, putting my name on the label. Um, and then I actually did some research anyway and found out I couldn't because it was already taken <laughs> uh, in California. I think actually. I may have this wrong, but I think it's by Les Claypool, the from Primus, uh, oh, uh, Primus, from Primus. He is, um, his family has a winery in like Anderson Valley. And so, so I couldn't do that. And so we started thinking about what's another name and we started just playing out. And, and there's this joke about either you do the family name or you do the band name. And uh, a really great winery here and, and he lives in Portland, makes in the Valley, it's called Love and Squalor. And that makes this beautiful wine. And I love the name because I always found it was like a great band name, mm -hmm. Love and Squalor. Um, so we started playing around with the name a little bit of being like, well, what else could we call it? And someone threw out Clay Pigeon, you know, some friends were sitting around, you know, and there was something about Clay Pigeon that I really did like because I felt it was kind of indicative. Uh, making wine is a bit like that. It goes back to that you get one chance a year. So this thing gets thrown and you just hope you hit it. Like, I mean, and it's going away from you and it's getting smaller and you just hope you hit it. But in, in essence, you're making choices and you're doing certain techniques, but on the whole, you won't even know if you hit it for a while. And you know, uh, it can take a year, two, or three before you even go like, yeah, I'm liking this. So I do feel like there's something about skeet and about clay pigeons. So clay pigeons, again, are the mm -hmm. little orange skeets for those that maybe don't know. Um, but uh, I do think that it has a very nice uh, metaphor for what we do. And, and tell us about the hand symbol that's part of your winery also. Yeah, so our, our logo, um, because of Clay Pigeon, we actually um, were playing around with that and decided to do um, um, the shadow puppet for Bird. And so basically it's uh, two hands that are drawn. And I think that again came, one, to show a little bit more whimsy about the name, but two, um, to show the handmade nature, to kind of keep connected that this is a, a product that is not, uh, that, that is every step we are touching. And, mm -hmm. and it is, it is n there are machines, but those machines are, um, doing some key heavy lifting, but on the whole, like we're in there every day. Um, so we were really kind of interested in the idea of the handmade nature of, of this product and what we do. Okay, so my name is Stephanie Hoffman and we're here for part two with Michael Claypool at Clay Pigeon Winery and it's July 25th, 2016. Um, my first question for you in this part two is the wine industry has really started to become an, an event focused industry lately. And we saw that you've really embraced it here with um, many events for like businesses and um, weddings. Mm -hmm. And so we were just wondering, was it like having um, events on top of making wine and having that balance? Yeah, I think it, I, when we started this space and we saw this, this building and we decided we wanted to, to kind of move in, you know, we had a couple of things happen. One, we were like, well, we could have a tasting room, but a tasting room kind of makes sense when it's like 
it's again like out in a place and you go to it, you try the stuff, you buy some bottles, you leave because you're coming from out of town. And again, if you live in the city and your business is in the city, you should be part of that community. And so we immediately embrace the idea of having much more of like a wine bar restaurant as a way to highlight our stuff, but to have other stuff, but to kind of really be a place that people could come daily rather than feeling like it's a special occasion or this is what I do on Saturday. Um, so that was step one. And then as we were kind of laying out the space, one of the key things is that we, the room that we're sitting in now, we treat for a lot of events. And it goes into simple math. A winery really is used about two months of the year. Truly used, where like you cannot have anyone in the space because there's too much going on. The other 10, it's sitting around, you're watching barrels age, um, you know, you're topping up, you're doing basic stuff, bottling at key moments. But on the whole, um, it sits pretty quiet. And we were like, well, people, like why we should try to make the space work a little bit harder than that. Um, and I think, yes, people then started going like, oh, well, you know, if you kind of show them a quick layout, then they can start to imagine their, their self in it. And this is where, again, having the restaurant is very helpful. People come in, they, have, they sit at the bar, they have a, a flight or they have a bite, some meat and cheese, and then they're kind of looking around and being like, oh, we could do something here. Um, and it was similar, like you know, out back, we have a patio um, kind of area. And we also like installed a bocce court. And we wanted to create the sense that it's its own little oasis. Um, and that people could come and really kind of make the space theirs. Um, and so, yes, we've been very open as far as like having groups come in to like have, whether it's corporate events or anniversaries or birthdays to weddings. Um, and and um, I think that people are always fascinated. There's something about looking at barrels that people really love. Um, <laughs> And um, they don't like the stainless equipment very much, I gotta say, they find that ugly, but they love barrels. So, you know, we, uh, um, and I think it's a great way for us because again, we're, this is the way you get your stuff out there. I'd, I'd much rather have 50 people try my wine and tell someone about it than, you know, put an ad somewhere. Um, there's just a better relationship and it's much more kind of authentic and, and, and true. Um, but it does mean like it's a very different kind of like, um, you know, curve as far as like your growth. But I think we've always really loved that people can come in and, and try our stuff, uh, but it's not necessarily like why they're here, which is kind of, kind of awesome. Like they come in because they love this couple that are getting married, but then it, by chance, we get to be associated with them, which is, is pretty, pretty fun. Nice, um, kind of going off of that, yeah. how have you um, kind of tackled marketing um, your wines? Because that's one of the most hated part for some people yeah. of the industry is selling the wine after you make it. Yeah. And so how have you <laughs> tackled that in the urban setting especially? Yeah, it, well, when we started, there's a couple of things kind of going on from a business standpoint. Um, when you kind of look at the, 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 the math around wineries, there's what they kind of call like a sustainability level, which is about a thousand cases. You need to be making about a thousand cases to be sustainable. Otherwise, you're probably not going to make enough to actually have any sort of like livelihood. But if you really talk to people, they always talk about the 5,000 case mark. And the 5,000 case mark is based on the idea that you're selling all your wine through a distributor. And the quick math on that is that basically, if you, if you sell a bottle for $30, you're roughly going to sell that bottle to a distributor for 15. Um, so you do the volume to make up the loss and profit. Um, our idea when we started thinking about the urban setup was could we create a space, a wine bar, restaurant, whatever you want to call it, but a space that basically is open for X number of nights that we can sell not just at retail but at restaurant price, then sell some through distributor, but through that mix, not have to go to 5,000 cases, could we hover closer to like two or 2,500? Um, and so that's been kind of the business plan we've kind of followed and we're growing to. We're not there yet because we've been taking our time getting there. Um, we sell 99% of our wine through the front door, um, either through the restaurant directly um, or through wine club or events. Um, and partly that's just been a volume game, honestly. Like we just haven't, while we've been growing, we just haven't made enough wine. We've sold out of everything as we go. Soon we'll reach a point where we're gonna have more volume than we have um, demand coming through that front door. So we're gonna need to go to a, a larger kind of uh, venue and that's where we'll probably look to distributors to help us with that. Um, first probably within Oregon and then have conversations outside as, as we kind of diversify the portfolio. But um, so far I've been very lucky on the sales side. I haven't had to, I agree, the selling of it can be a little daunting. Um, and 
so I've been very lucky in the sense that you know we have a, a good a good crew working over here that that are in, uh, passionate about our product and so they help us sell it every day. <laughs> <laughs> good. Um, what is your favorite part of the wine industry? It's a good question. You know, it's a funny thing where um, I really love the sommelier side of the job. The thing I always hated at the time was just the hours. It's a really intense experience, uh, especially working at a pretty high-end restaurant. Um, but uh, I, I loved, uh, I've always loved basically, and this actually happened even as a, at the wine shop, which was like trying to as fast as possible learn what you like and determine what's the thing that's going to make you the most happy. Um, you know, the making of the process and that is super fun. It's always cool. There's a thousand decisions that people don't realize that you're constantly like having to decide at any given moment. And that's really fun in its own way. Um, but it's also very like nerve wracking. You know, these wines are sitting in a barrel and I could mess them up and then make vinegar very quickly. Um, it's also a terrible business model because you're paying for the stuff up front and then you spend uh, two to three years waiting for it to come to, so all you have is inventory, you're just inventory on inventory. Um, so that side of the business is like, it has its challenges, it has its head, but I love that moment because I always say like, if I'm having you try a wine, I, you do not need to know anything about this wine except do you find it yummy? <laughs> if you don't find this wine yummy, there's no reason to tell you about the vineyard or to the make process, none of that matters. It just doesn't matter. Like, find you something you really love. Um, that is still the thing I love the most, and that is, I, I think, the thing I love about having the, the, the wine bar, is like, the ability to still have those interactions, to go talk to someone and then say, I don't really like red wine, um, or I never drink, like, a woman coming in saying, I never drink white, and I'm like, what? And I'm like, that's crazy, what do you mean? And she starts talking about it more, and I'm like, oh, okay. And then I was like, well, what do you normally drink? You drink this, 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 okay, I think I can find you something. And like watching that moment happen, because I think a lot of times, especially I think in wine, it's not a cheap mistake. If you, if you order wrong, it can be quite expensive, especially out. You can spend 10, 15 bucks on a glass of wine and be like, mm. you know, beer, four or five bucks, you're like, mm. you know, not the end of the world. It just, it just feels different. So I feel like our job in the industry is to, to really kind of elevate that to be like, no, that's not good enough. Like, you should love this wine that you're drinking. You're spending good money for it. And so I still think that that is one part of the business I really love because I think it's really helping activate for people that pleasure and that there's this relationship to like what they're having and being like, no, 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 try it with that. I think you're going to love it when you take a bite of that salad or this dish. Uh, because I think that's the moment that they see it beyond a way to relax or like, have a good time with their friends and see it as like again a, a a an integral part of the table. Cool. Um, what organizations are you part of in the wine industry? Um, this one, the only one I'm in, is called the PDX Urban Wineries Group, and so it's a it's a, a trade organization, marketing organization that is of at this point 14 urban wineries. So um, we. Um, help promote each other, the industry that obviously urban wine is a legitimate thing and you should be checking it out. Uh, and we end up holding about three events a year. But largely it's also a great opportunity, you know, to have access to other winemakers to talk through issues you might have, like could I borrow X to whatever it might be. Um, those things are still like a, a key part of it. Um, but that is at this point the one organization that, that I'm part of. Um, I haven't really done as much down in the valley yet, and partly it's just um, because I still have my day job. Mm -hmm. um, between the, the day job and then coming at, to the restaurant on, on certain nights, like it's hard to really kind of find the time to kind of uh, um, be respectful to the organization and be a true, true member. So I picked my one. <laughs> uh, what is the future for Clay Pigeon? I think for Clay Pigeon, like the, the idea is to, uh, as I say, like we have this hypothesis on on what's the size we can get to. Um, I think in the next couple of years we're going to find out if I was right or wrong. Um, but my hope is that basically to, to keep growing a bit more. Like I said, I, I didn't get into this because I, I want to make 100,000 cases of anything or even 10,000 cases to be honest. Um, I like the hands-on approach and stuff, so I want to keep it small. Um, but I think the next phase would be, you know, obviously taking the wine out and starting to kind of see it placed in uh, other kind of key cities. Um, that I think is, is always fun and always enjoyable. Like uh, I travel a fair amount and 
it's always great when I hit a city and I open it, I look at a wine list and I see one of my friend's wines on the list. And you know, it's always like a, you know, there's an ego there that's like, oh, I'd like to be on this list too someday. Um, and I get it, like right now I don't have enough to make it really worth their while to, to deal with me. So uh, I'm really looking forward to the next few years doing that. And then what is in the future for the per Portland urban winery industry? I think it'll be a really interesting next, like let's say five years. I think Portland has grown so fast um, and the intensity with development, I think is gonna be a really interesting moment to see how much um, we're allowed to stay a part of this community. Um, I think like, what I think makes it so unique um, is we're not in like a really terrible edge of town warehousey place. Like we're allowed to be in like some of the central areas. Like we are five minutes from downtown. Like, and if you look at a lot of major cities, like you just can't pull that off. Like the prices are just not, not gonna allow you to have a space like this or even bigger. I think the market pressure is gonna shift that a lot. And I'll, I, I don't really have an answer of like, I really hope we all get to stay and we get to kind of maintain our spaces and to kind of keep growing with the communities. Um, like the neighborhood we're in, which is we call the Eastside Industrial, um, you know, there's a lot of new construction that's coming up around us. They want these services. They, I mean, having a winery, uh, having a brewery, having these things are there. Um, but I think it's, um, um, I think it'll be an, an interesting period to see like how many of us are able to stay or if it too kind of shifts where to be able to stay, you have to just start with a lot of money and buy a building and just, and like make that investment like you do in the Valley of buying land um, and thus kind of controlling your space. So I don't know, I, I, I'm, I'm optimistic that we'll figure it out. Um, but I also know that, look, you know, markets are markets and cities evolve constantly. And um, there's a reason why there's like two wineries in New York City. Mm -hmm. It's real expensive and they're built by millionaires. So it's like, um, <laughs> that, you know, it, it's just, it's just a certain point it can start to get unfeasible, mm -hmm. not feasible. Okay. Um, what advice do you have for anyone who wants to join the Oregon wine industry? The thing that I always love about wine, and I found this also in California working down there, is um, it's just passion. You just got to want to do it. Uh, and you got to be willing to acknowledge that. Again, I, when people say they want to help out or they want to see how winemaking is about or they ask questions about getting into winemaking, I, the first thing I always say is, like, do you like cleaning? Because <laughs> if the answer is no, you don't really want to be a winemaker. You want to be around wine, work at a shop, be a sommelier, write about it, um, take tr people on tours. Winemaking is a lot of cleaning. It's, um, and that's great. That's a totally acceptable thing. And so I think the trick is basically teaching people very quickly, like, just get in there. If you, can, if you have the passion and you're willing to like dive in and like do the work, um, the community's there for you. Like, I, I find that I, I've always been fascinated of how um, inclusive the wine industry is like it's um you would really assume that we would start to really dislike each other because of just market but it really doesn't happen and i think i think that just comes i'm not even sure exactly why i think some of it comes because it's a fairly new industry and so everyone was kind of bootstrapping it and getting started and everyone had to help each other even though they were competitors and then that ethos kind of stuck and and we choose every year to keep that ethos going as a collective group rather than deciding that we're gonna to start to say like, these are trade secrets and I'm never gonna tell you anything about what I do. Um, chefs are the same way. Kitchens are amazing in this way. And I find it really fascinating. Like, you know, people will be like, hey, can I just come over and stage at your restaurant for a week just to see how you make something? They're gonna steal your idea. Like, they're pretty blatant about it. But we do it and they, and it's a very much part of the, the culture and the custom. And I love that about wine, that, that people can come over and see what we're up to, go, wow, I hadn't really thought about doing it that way, or, oh, that's funny, you know, um, hey, have you ever thought about this? Or, and I think if you show the true passion and you basically are willing to just like climb in and start like getting dirty, um, people are gonna be very receptive to having you around and being part of the, of the group. It, again, you don't get into it because we, we pay a lot of money. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's not why we do it. Um, there's plenty of jobs you can do for a lot more money. So um, you're doing it because you wanna just like be a part of that. And I think, I, I, and I always kind of say like, you know, the desire to be a part of a community is, is, is always helpful because people will just kind of feel it on you of like, you're just there to really take um, rather than like have a, a, a real reciprocal relationship.
what do you like to make? Yeah, so um, I'd love to say that I, I have a theme, you know. I only make um, Beaujolais style wines or things from Germany or something from this. Um, again, I think because of the Somali background, I, my, my tastes are a little too broad for that. Um, I make Pinot, but I would actually say that Pinot is not really the wine that I would say I'm the most known for or um, what I make the most of. Uh, I make it because there's great grapes and it's always fun to play with. It's a really interesting grape to work with and very difficult. So I make uh, Pinot, uh, but the, the main focus has always been Cab Franc and Syrah. Um, and again, I wish I could say like, I make things from the Rhone. Nope, I have like Loire and I have like, you know, the Rhone kind of as influences. Um, but I think in the end what it is is I really like to try to make make wines that hit a diversity of food. You know, I think Cap Franc has a very specific kind of um, food category that it works with, Pinot um, to Syrah, and then in the whites, uh, I make some Pinot Gris, but I really, the passion project is, uh, is Chardonnay, but made in a style from the region called Jura, which is from France. And Jura is, a, is known, uh, and it's gained a lot more attention in the last few years because they make these highly oxidized whites. Um, so what it really entails for us is we process the, the Chardonnay, we put it in a barrel, and then we don't open the barrel for three years. Right. While it's, what's happening is it's every day, it's evaporating, and so by the time we actually bottle the wine, it's gonna be down probably five to eight to 10 gallons. And what's happening slowly is that it's, it's, it's turning to vinegar slowly, but because it's a controlled amount of oxygen, it becomes um, more like a light sherry. Um, it becomes highly oxidized and like nutty aromas start to come through. It gets really golden. Um, it's a style of wine that I love and I love it with food and I, I got introduced uh, from the sommelier side. Um, so I've been experimenting with that uh, a bit more, which is always kind of fun. Though again, it takes forever, you know, so three years, then you bottle it and you wait maybe another year. So <laughs> this, I'll, I'll never see it, you know, before it's done. But uh, yeah, uh, that's the kind of the stuff we like to make here. Awesome. Good. Okay, well, thank you so thank much. Thank you.